It is thanks to the great literary talents of A.S. Afterlife that I am able to present to you tonight's reading. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit back and relax as we delve into the tale of the Incubus Experiments. The Existence of Demons apparitions, werewolves, and vampires. They are all constructions of the human mind, monstrosities conjured by our own phobias. Why do we create such devilish beings? Why fabricate things that cause our weary minds to experience the feeling we all know too well as fear. Maybe it is because the demons we fear the most are the ones that exist right beneath our feet. They are the ones we see every day, those we consistently interact with, the monsters we create keep us from losing sanity in the realization of the world's vulnerabilities to evil. The existence of these fox creatures help us to forget about the lives in real life. My nightmares, which only now began to plague me, consisted of a creature that continually haunted my childhood condemning me to a life riddled with doctor visits and psychiatric screenings. The help sought out by my domineering parents finally gave way by the age of 12. Being now 25, I thought I was forever rid of the creature. That is, until it returned in the form of a phantasm. I decided to pursue a cure for my steadily decreasing health. Insomnia began to vex my sleeping habits and I began having vivid hallucinations. It became routine to lie awake in bed, gawking at the empty, barren white walls that now mocked my inability to rest. I found my desired relief when I stumbled upon an institution by the name of Heisenberg Institute. They informed me of their activities in the science of onirology, how their development of experimental technologies could have the ability to infiltrate your dreams, constructing them into more pleasant experiences. They were looking for potential candidates for a research study, three men and three women, completely isolated, only having the freedom to sleep. Their brains would be monitored with transmitters throughout the experiment, especially during the hours of REM sleep. Communications between participants would be prohibited, acting against said rule would result in the removal of the participant. I thought on how sketchy it all seemed, but the desperation to rid myself of my woeful nighttime visions allowed me to act against my suspicions. I half-heartedly agreed to partake in their experimental analysis, as so did a few others. When we arrived at the institution for the experiment, we were all led into a vacant room void of all personal possessions. The room was bare. Several beds were sprawled about the room. Specks of haphazard lighting trickled through a single minute window that was smeared over with soot. The floors were cracked and unpolished as if stampedes of sewage floods had marched their way through. The only sanitary thing seemed to be the beds. 
we were all handed a small notepad to document our experiences while staying in the room. Once again, reminded not to speak. We all cleaned a bed, then settled in. The door was closed. A boisterous sounding click followed close behind. Whilst lying in bed, I couldn't help but notice a girl around my age sitting in the bed opposite of mine. The majority of the participants were of old or middle age. It was nice to see someone of my age here. She quickly took notice of me as well, flashing me a rather hesitant smile. I smiled back, then looked around the room, scanning it for hidden cameras or microphones. When I was sure that there were none in sight, I quickly scribbled the word, Hi and held it up in her direction. She froze from my sudden advancements of communication, but reluctantly returned my gesture. Is it safe to talk here? What if there are cameras around? I made one last glance around the room, making sure to cover every crevice. I don't think there are from what I can see. I think it's safe if we write. She nodded in comprehension, and began writing another note. So, what you're in for? I chuckled quietly at her comment, scrawling my clumsily dictated letters onto the notepad. Just wanting to get rid of these stupid nightmares. What about you? Same. Been feeling like shit for weeks. She jotted her words down in almost perfect handwriting. I made an overly exaggerated, taunting face of concern. Aw, the princess can't handle a bad dream. Bite me. She returned my rhetorical sarcasm with an elevated middle finger. I snickered, just beginning to write a quirky comeback when the latch door suddenly clicked open. I quickly closed and slipped the pad under my leg. The girl hid hers between her folded arms. Several men dressed in white medical attire, wheeled in buggies, carrying what I assumed were the transmitters. They were all collectively connected to a large, futuristic-looking machine. They handed us each a helmet, instructing us to put them on and flip the switch in the back. They informed us that these machines could somehow monitor the activity in our dreams and possibly allow us to voyage into other dreams as well. I began to feel the experiment wouldn't be as unsettling as I originally thought, but one of the scientist's words forced that feeling under submission. There may be times when you begin to confuse reality with fabrications, your nightmares will more than likely become real hallucinations. But please try to keep a calm demeanor. They are nothing but illusions. And with that, they all left, locking the door behind them. We all wore an expression of fear and unexpectance. None of us were prepared for what was to come during this experiment. That night, my childhood demon once again invaded my less than pleasurable slumber. I was forced to lie awake, listening to the sounds of deep breaths and emphatic snoring. I became painfully aware of the many participants that spoke in their sleep. Echoes of screams and panic filled the relatively small room. It would seem as though we all had demons. The words of the scientist rallied in my head like a crowd of boisterous protesters. What had he meant when he said our dreams could become reality? I spent all night trying to make sense of his words, managing only to loathe the sound of snoring 
even more. The first one awake was the girl. It wasn't surprising, really. Judging by their screams, I figured this was the most sleep any of them had gotten in days. She stretched, letting out a murmured yawn before smiling widely at me. I smiled back and pulled out my notepad. Had a nice sleep? Eh, for the most part. You? Hell no. All those snores and screams made it damn near impossible. Not to mention my reoccurring nightmare. Aww. Who's the princess now? She laughed behind the cover of her hand. So, you're a comedian, huh? Amy Schumer or Whitney Cummings? Well, I did steal your joke. Touché. You know, I never really got a name. It's Jennifer, but you can call me Jen. And yours? The name's Kyle. Nice to officially meet you. We continued our intriguing conversation until the other participants were jolted awake by their own restlessness. One even managing to yell out, Don't rip me apart! before abruptly waking in a pool of excessive perspiration. About an hour later, the scientist reeled in carts of syrup-soaked pancakes and less than appetizing looking scrambled eggs, handing each of us a tray. Before leaving, the same scientist who spoke those haunting words turned to me, a scowl stretched across his otherwise expressionless face. You should think against lying awake tonight. Otherwise, we will have to expel you from the experiment. Hmm. Huh. Guess they were monitoring something after all. While forcibly scarfing down the foul-tasting complimentary breakfast, I noticed a small pile of pills sitting beside a cup of water labeled, Take These. I looked around. Everyone, including Jen, opted to take the suspicious mystery pills. I decided to play along and take them as well, envisioning them as some sort of lucid dreaming aid. There wasn't much to do after that. Jen had decided to take a quick nap, and I doubted any of the others would agree to a witty conversation via handwritten text. Most, despite their nighttime terrors, opted to nap as well, their screams and cries following not too long after that. My crippling boredom eventually lulled me to sleep. I tossed and turned as I dreamed again of the creature, its vacant eyes staring down at me while it pinned me to the ground its putrid saliva drooling from its mouth, dripping onto my cowering body. It lowered its unhinged jaws towards me, and before taking a large chunk from my face, I woke up to a loud bang, followed by scratching noises. It was one of the participants. He was banging his head hard against the door, and pawing at it like a trapped dog. Let me out! The beast! The beast it comes! Large amounts of blood trickled to the floor. Jen gasped from the sight. Two other participants rushed over to him, trying desperately to pry him away, but he wouldn't budge. His fingers were filing down to the bone. His skull began to crack from the constant banging. In one last fluid motion, his skull gave way and he fell to the floor, completely void of life. We all screamed in terror, some turning away from the gruesome spectacle. Two of the scientists rushed in with a gurney, hauling the lifeless cadaver away in an instant without uttering a word. None of us could figure out what the hell happened. Maybe his dream had become too real. Maybe it finally broke him. 
the scientist's words rang in my head. Our dreams could become a reality. I was beginning to know what he meant. None of us slept that night. We were too transfixed by the man's sudden death, still unsure as to how it all began. Sleep was the furthest thing from my mind, from any of our minds. As I laid still in my bed, the sound of the beast's growl resonated through my ears. A feeling of dread washed over me. I was hoping not to be the next to lose my mind. I decided to ignore it, remembering the damning advice given to us by that scientist. To just stay calm. Stay calm, huh? I'm not so sure that I can.